kingdom really, really like? Would you start perhaps with Daniel chapter 2? The king of ancient Babylon's nightmare. Daniel chapter 2. The king sprung awake, drenched in sweat, bed linens tangled, breathing heavily like after a hard run, heart racing. This ego-driven worldly king saw a most perplexing dream. And the meaning of it was unknown, but because of the nature of the dream, the sense of threat was very real. It disturbed him. The question of what this dream meant was very much plaguing his mind. And it was a great statue of various substances, gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. And yet this spectacular statue carved out of what would then be the most skilled of humans on earth had been easily crushed and effortlessly ground into powder upon contact by an ever-approaching and quickly growing rock formation that no human could have cut out or sculpted. It's interesting the portrayals and depictions of, uh, of many uh, artists' rendering of this dream. And this was the most clear and vivid one. I used this for sure. One animation showed it to be as though a comet perhaps, and then it turned into a substance that became green and covered the whole earth. <laughs> I like that idea. I personally think that it was huge, but nonetheless, this is a good start and it shows well in art. Such a sight, and we can only imagine this in motion, such a sight of greater mysterious powers even as a dream to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon naturally caused him to toss and to turn. Very anxious about this meaning, we know that it was given to him through God's command, obviously, and through his means. So I can only imagine the most intense and vivid dream you've ever had. And it's fascinating how in this one dream, without any words, you see the whole history from that point forward of mankind and the whole point of the gospel. Incredible. But he didn't know that at the time. I wish that we knew the frequency and the timing of this dream, but after he had had enough of a restless night, he called his wise men to interpret the meaning, and of course none of them could, except a young, faithful young boy named Daniel, who requested, they had been taken captivity, he requested time with his friends to pray that God would grant them blessing and grace to interpret this meaning or this dream. And Daniel returned at proper time and spoke exactly what the dream meant. The statue's head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar himself and his current kingdom of Babylon. The second was inferior and would rise, then a third. Bottom line, we're skipping some stuff. Finally, the fourth kingdom, as strong as iron and yet as brittle as clay. Interesting enough, it's in the midst of this fourth kingdom that God of heaven established or set up his kingdom in the form of what we see as the church, those who would be gathered together under a special group and identity and name. What would this kingdom mean? From that point forward, it would be known as the church, but we'll study reasons as to why. This kingdom would not be left for some other to supersede it. It's almost as if because of the dream, it doesn't matter what happens after that. Once the kingdom comes, that's the most important thing. And then the implication is kingdoms will rise and fall. So it's interesting that as you begin to talk to others about the kingdom, would you start with Daniel chapter two? I don't know, but this is an interesting idea because from this idea and the grandeur image that you see and that you saw, Nebuchadnezzar then died as is the case, pointed unto men once to die, even for kings. Over 500 years pass, the Jews watched. And, of course, the Jews continued to be in captivity for a while, but conjuring up physical images of what this kingdom would be like because of their understanding and as word spreads, what's this kingdom going to be? Well, let me tell you the dream, and it's going to be great. It's going to conquer the world. <laughs> Jews remain in captivity, but then Cyrus of the Persians freed them, or at least allowed them to go home, and then there's where we have the story of the rebuilding of the temple, the building of the walls several years later. They eventually, um, but 
mm, though they established themselves, they were never to the point where they were in their glory days of David and Solomon, never. And so they were a subject nation in some respects to this day. Many other powers existed all around them. The Medo-Persians were defeated by the Greeks. And if it wasn't for this one dream, uh, clearly implying the Greeks, we would not know anything in scripture about them. That's during the intertestamental period of time where prophetic silence was the case for uh, several hundred years. So they were left with what they had and were conjuring up ideas what this kingdom must be must be like. During this time, the Jews were passed back and forth in the divided kingdoms uh, after Alexander died. You have the Maccabees with uh, great motivation. <laughs> they brought fire, of course, upon the Jews. The Maccabees did, and their, the Jews' motivation started with a great cause to uphold righteousness and take back the land. And They rallied and defeated the Greeks, winning religious and political independence. But then this was not the kingdom that was promised, far, far from it. A fourth kingdom soon arose, and it dominated the current world of the day, Rome. Rome. And they welcomed anyone who would not put up a fight. <laughs> Limited rule, but nonetheless, Jews were stuck in the middle for sure. But in the days of Caesar Augustus, a child was born in the back rotter of a little subservient country of the Jews. Angels, we were told, proclaimed good tidings to nearby shepherds. Wise men traveled to honor him and prophecies that were surrounding his earthly life. This could be, or could this be, the king? About 30 years later, his cousin began to preach in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 2. He is baptized by John and in the river of Jordan Jesus the Nazarene is baptized fulfilling all righteousness then Jesus himself begins to preach of the gospel of the kingdom the good news of the kingdom in chapter 4 verses 17 and 23 uh, his teaching was coupled with miracles that even as we heard in class his enemies could not deny <laughs> and yet they didn't make the right conclusion because they were selfish and prideful in their hearts they were not humble so this person, this Jesus, is proving to be exactly who he said he was. Jesus. His gospel of the kingdom is summarized in the Sermon on the Mount. But you know what? As he begins to tell people what this kingdom is and is all about, uh, Jesus' audiences were well acquainted with worldly kingdoms. And that's one of the factors that made his words stand out so much because this was obviously going to be very different than before. They did not get what they were expecting. And Jesus' gospel is far different. So we're going to ask ourselves, what is the kingdom? And next week, a little more of a generic lesson is how can we be part of it as we look at the sermon as well? How can we be part of whatever this kingdom is? Today, let's look at this. What a shock to those who were seeing it, the Jews who were just now being told and witnessing what God's prophesied kingdom was. All throughout the years, if they had thought about it and wondered what this astounding, enormous, growing, superior, enormous, growing rock was going to be that shattered all earthly kingdoms, not made by human hands, what was that going to be like? What was it really like? It wasn't what they were expecting. It's actually something better. There's a phrase in the Sermon on the Mount that even as it begins, I took for granted in all of my readings because I already knew it. And I'll look, I looked more on the teaching than I did at the actual uh, uh, phrase. So let's put some verses together and see if you notice this phrase as well. Let's start with the actual um, subpoints first. The nature of the kingdom, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A few verses later, in verse 10, Jesus continued, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 19. Those who obey the commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And then we learn in verse 20, And those who... Uh, those whose righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees will enter the kingdom of heaven. As we read about the kingdom, the primary point here is it is not of this earth. It is of heaven. So whatever this kingdom is, it's different. 
John 18, 36, he says the kingdom is not of this world. It's not of land and territory. It's, um, it's not going to conquer or seek to conquer nations uh, the way that you would expect by war, but liberate them. It will not seek to wage war, but bring peace. How will it not seek to dominate? Well, um, in the ways that we spread it, it will triumph in showing mercy. And some extra common notes uh, regarding Matthew as we jump to, Ma uh, actually not Matthew, Luke's account. Jumping to Luke's account, he talks about the paradox of the gospel and what this kingdom is. It lives by a whole new different set of standards. The humble will be exalted. The proud will be humbled. The mighty are put down. The lowly are exalted. The unacceptable has now become accepted through human eyes, of course. Women become sinful women who become witnesses and disciples for Christ. These were the outcasts, just like the Samaritans, who now in this kingdom do noble deeds, where a Gentile can have even more faith than a Jew, where terrible sinners can be forgiven. Everything seems to be backwards. This is not like what they expected. In some cases, if they had an evil heart, it wasn't what they wanted. So, such a contrast was then illustrated in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The statue that represented worldly kingdoms made with human hands, that won't last. It will be even destroyed when <laughs> the Lord comes back for his kingdom. All these things of the world are going to be gone. Nations rise and fall, but his kingdom endures. The kingdom of God, of heaven, not only is here to stay, but it will endure. And it is the only thing on earth right now that will continue and outlive this world. Because Jesus' kingdom doesn't reside in human hands, but dwells in human hearts. Luke 17, 21, Jesus explained the kingdom is within us and no worldly opposition can conquer that space if we are devoted to our king. What are citizens of the kingdom like? That's a good question to determine what the kingdom is through heaven's eyes. So imagine you were looking at this for the first time and being shocked. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the poor in spirit. Acts 22, 28, there are two ways that the Jews were familiar with with how you become a citizen of a kingdom. One, you're born into it, or you buy your citizenship into it. They were familiar with that. But Jesus said and implied, and Ron also taught about this this morning, citizens are those who are poor in spirit. So your physical birth makes no difference anymore. John 3, 3 through 5, and his conversation with Nicodemus makes it clear your spiritual rebirth makes all the difference. And Jesus didn't say, blessed are the Jews who were born into the kingdom. No, 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 no. That's how they were thinking. Jews needed to hear this. The kingdom is not about physical qualifications, but spiritual Character is key, which meant a lot of them were already out. So Jews, this kingdom is not for you only. And even if you're a descendant of Abraham without a change of heart, not even you can be a part of this kingdom of the humble humility. Incredible. That's a hard teaching for some, isn't it? Especially those who think that they're better than others. Jesus said, poor in spirit. Think of this beautiful truth. The kingdom is open to anyone. Anyone who comes to Christ in faith. It's just as easy for God to graft into the kingdom a wealthy person here upon this earth who fully trusts in Jesus as it is easy for the Lord of heaven to add into his kingdom an impoverished person who also loves Christ wholeheartedly. Beautiful. What a surprise to discover that this kingdom does not go to the perceived worthies, but to those who recognize their need for the righteousness of Christ. It goes to those who realize in terms of righteousness they have nothing otherwise to offer God except their humble, desperate, grateful heart, soul, and mind. 
And as they mourn their sin, gently submitting to God, seeking after his righteousness, hungering and thirsting for it, he provides, God provides his righteousness in abundance and inheritance, eternal comfort and glories of heaven itself. That's a promise that we can partake of even now in terms of salvation and the mindset that operates our lives. It's beautiful. Obviously very different. The nature of the kingdom of heaven. I know we can relate to this. The kingdom of the harassed. This is one of the reasons I'm actually looking forward to heaven. There won't be any of that there. This is the oddest and most perplexing thing about the kingdom. It has spread throughout the entire world and has already proven to outlast nations. They rise and fall and it's still here. And yet it is and will continue to be as long as the earth spins, harassed in, in every way, all through the way. And while on earth there is much and there is powerful opposition to this kingdom of divine love and truth from evil hearts, Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says the kingdom belongs to those who are persecuted. In the arena of good versus evil, which is what we're here for to show the superiority of God's righteousness and glorify him, the opponents of good will always put up a fight. And how amazing it is that a kingdom fueled by agape love remains under constant attack, and yet it keeps growing. It must be something divinely special indeed. And it's interesting that in Acts 8, 1 through 4, it's having to face that opposition that caused those who settled too long in Jerusalem to get out and spread the word like they should have earlier. It's sad that they waited that long. But wherever the gospel goes, it yields eternal fruit. Even though those who come into the kingdom know they will be harassed by those who reject the light of life. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. There's no way around that. There really isn't. We talked about that recently. But Acts chapter 14 verse 22, Paul told the newly established congregations that through their many tribulations, they must enter the kingdom. It's going to be the initiation for sure and the way of life for many. On a spiritual level, entering the kingdom of God does protect us from the devil's attacks in that we are no longer overtaken by the temptation or suffering the guilt and consequence of sin and death. We're over that. We're through that. And we prove victorious over more and more temptations as we walk in the light, continually cleansed. But, but physically, we are still in a world where we suffer the consequence of Satan's attacks. It's certainly consistent with doctrine to say that if you're suffering some trial or tragedy, better than asking, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Rather to say, I must be doing something right. Because those walking in the light of God, shining that light, will produce the mistreatment back from those who prefer to walk in darkness. And while we just don't like that fact. We sure look forward to our reward. That's why one of the reasons I told David I love songs about heaven. Encourage people what we're here for and what we're looking forward to. Don't think that in those trials God's not with you. Because quite the contrary, it's in those attacks. His presence can be more clearly seen. Philippians 1.28 teaches something very interesting. Because of the wording, it might not be clearly understood upon first reading. So Philippians 1.28, study this on your own time and, and go back to remember what, what, I, what we talked about this. Blatant persecution proves they are lost and you are saved. Isn't that what that says? If we are harassed for being like him, then it's proof to the Christian that he or she is in the kingdom and it's reserved by the power of God through our faith in him and his shed blood. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Incredible. That alone would be worth our time and today and encouragement. But the kingdom of heaven is something else. The kingdom is of those of the righteous. <laughs> what makes us righteous? Matthew 5, 20 says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> if you want to know 
If you travel back in time, if you want to know how righteous the Pharisees were, just go ask them. They will tell you. Uh, Luke 18 shows a, a, a Pharisee basically bragging to God about himself, of how holy he is and how great he is. People everywhere could see their religious behaviors. That was one of the reasons for their daily habits. They wanted people to see. They got the praise of men, but that's all. Matthew 6 we can see their religious acts that people saw. And people would wonder, some people would wonder, wow, how can I beat that? How can I do better than they? And then the perspective of the kingdom of the heart changes everything. Imagine the offensive impact of this truth bomb that Jesus drops on them in Matthew 21, verse 31. Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, I truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven before you. Can you imagine how they would have wanted to kill Jesus on the spot for saying that? But how can that be? I can tell you how it can be. It's possible when the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners, as though we're all, not all, realize their own brokenness and they turn to God, hungering and thirsting for his righteousness. And as they do, God gives his righteousness. He imputes it to them because in faith they seek it through Christ alone. This is biblical faith that leads to a changed life. Philippians 3, 9 through 11. The Pharisees had as much righteousness as they possibly could get if you view their own obedience to what they perceived to be the law of God in the Old Testament. They relied on the law and thought that that was making them righteous. However, the righteousness that comes from the full dependence upon Christ supersedes all else and gives us the motivation to serve. I am not stressed at all in my obedience. Always wanting to do better, yes, but God knowing that, we're not trying to spin our own wheels to cover the road towards heaven. We're walking with every step of the way, supported by Christ. Romans 7, 14 through 25, we are empowered and motivated by the grace of God to serve him joyously. That's evidence of a genuine faith. Ephesians 2.10, Titus 2.14 come into play. Pharisees would eventually, if you back them into the corner, enough for them to look at things objectively, they would have to admit that on their own, they just couldn't be good enough obeying this old law or their perception of it on their own to enter this kingdom. Only by the righteousness of Christ who shed his blood, his sinless blood to atone for my sin and by my faith graft me into the kingdom can I then live for God and joyously so. Not of my own works lest we should boast. Luke 18, 9 and Philippians 2, 12 and 13 come into play. And so let's complement this point by the next. The kingdom of the obedient. Bottom line, kingdom citizens joyously obey their king. Our righteousness comes by grace through faith, but we must stay balanced. Philippians 2 comes into play by saying the salvation that grace provides is too precious to not hold on to. Now think about this. Hold on to the salvation that you received and were given and live it out by holding on to it. Holding on to it by living it out. Biblical faith is living the kingdom life. Jesus knew that people would twist his teaching on grace. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus spoke with people who were so religious, they even argued with Jesus. Can you imagine that? <laughs> people do that today in their minds. They rebutted Jesus when he said, you are calling me by name, yes, but not obeying me. Luke 6, 46, he asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I tell you? That's a very good question. Why do people argue with Jesus and they say that he's still their savior? I don't understand that. Jesus wants us to observe all the things he has said. And we listen to everything he says. Why? Because he is deity. He's God. And he's my savior, my king. Keep growing in this regard. Second Peter 1, faith, knowledge, virtue. Not being part of the kingdom of uh, heaven if we are thinking that grace is a license for disobedience. That just doesn't work. So the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of the obedient. 
And it's also the kingdom of the militant. Now, this is interesting. Militant, but not violent. Bold, but not brash. We, by definition, militantly spread the kingdom throughout the world, but we do so through peace, reconciliation. Since the kingdom of God has been established and is here on earth in the form of his church after his ascension in that day of Pentecost, we go back to the, sermon, to the model prayer in chapter 6, verse 10 of Matthew, and, and we don't repeat every word just the same. To, moder, to currently apply the model prayer, we do not pray for his kingdom to come in the sense that they were. No, we pray for God's dominion over people's hearts to spread the kingdom, God's dominion over people's hearts to spread throughout the entire earth until he returns. And in that sense, if that's what's in your mind, go ahead and say those words. But, but lest we misunderstand or convey a wrong idea to people, the kingdom is here. He did what he came to, to accomplish. And we want the Lord to return so that we can go beyond this earth and live in heaven. But while we're here, citizens of heaven, living on earth, we pray for the heavenizing of earth to make it more like heaven. Uh, we do not do so through the sword through political mechanisms, though all support that lays a groundwork for the encouragement is there, we spread the kingdom by spreading the peace of God. We are a kingdom of peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. We have a ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 10, Paul explained that our warfare is teaching to win the hearts of mind. A lot of people just don't want teaching. But through that mechanism, we touch the hearts with the word of God, the double-edged sword. I like what our Wednesday night speaker said, go, it cuts going and a coming. I've heard that phrase my whole life. It was good to hear it again. We do this with intensity, with purpose and courage. And as a result of teaching all that Christ says is of heaven, teaching it to a sinful world, well, let's just say it. Point seven. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of the minority. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go, by in, uh, go in there by it. Verse 14. Because, why do, why do more people go the broad way? Because narrow is the gate and difficult hard is the way which leads to life and there are few that find it i've heard it said that having one choice is no choice at all people have two choices to make christ or anything else there is only one right choice to make but you do have a choice to make christ or anything else the path that provides greater spiritual blessing and eternal life is ironically less chosen. And it's partly because it is more difficult. And that's only because of the opposition of sin in this world and the struggles that we have as well because of it. But, but because of all of this, it will never be more than a minority. I love gatherings where hundreds and thousands of Christians are gathered. I love that. Because it reminds me I'm not alone. I'm teaching on, on a particular topic of fellowship this coming Wednesday elsewhere. And this concept of fellowship is, is interesting. Long story short, we were in fellowship even when we weren't together. Some people are together and they're not in fellowship. So fellowship is not just assembling. We encourage each other when we're assembling. <laughs> But I love being reminded in those moments that I'm not alone, that I partake of the mind of Christ with others. We know that fewer will want to be part of us, but we are not seeking success through popularity, through numbers. I'd rather have quantity, or I should say quality than quantity, but I prefer to have both if you can. God's way works. Certainly not through world domination 
We work to point people to the Savior, just making disciples. But we know that we will always be a minority working for the highest cause. And in so living and in so sharing the kingdom of heaven, we will keep growing, we will keep persevering and waiting, waiting for the king to return. In conclusion, after this lesson, I hope that you appreciate more the parable of Matthew 13, the kingdom parable of the sifting of the two kingdoms. Bottom line, there are two kingdoms cohabitating this planet. Two kingdoms right now cohabitating this planet. And they will be sifted when the Lord returns. But we had better be clear on where our allegiance lies. We must make our calling and our election sure. Second Peter 1, we must make sure to live this sermon on the mount because Jesus is the king. The question for you, if you didn't know anything else about this kingdom, would it be intriguing enough and the blessings promised enough to, to want to be a part of, to live a whole new life, no longer like the ways of the world and how they think and behave. No, 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 no. This is a whole new kingdom. But then to have the promise of the Lord returning and being with you eternally as he takes you to be with him in heaven, presented to the Father. Wow. For those of you who are already members of the body of Christ, maybe you see the kingdom in a whole new light. You know, the concept of is the kingdom the church and is the church the kingdom? <laughs> they relate because there's no way now as an accountable adult baptized into Christ for remission of sins to not be added to his body on earth, the church to carry out his will on earth. <laughs> but what about the people before Christ and his, his established church? They obeyed God's given will for them because they had a heart of the kingdom to let the Lord reign over their hearts. And today we do that through his will that he established in the New Testament, a new covenant. Are you a part of that? And does it show in all that you say and do? If not, that may be a cause for you to come forward and repent as well. And we all do, if not by public confession, personal conviction. Let's let this lesson help us be more like the citizens of that kingdom that we've learned about today. If you're a subject, then won't you come as we stand and as we sing.